Um, I think my own experience with the rule of law is that if effectively structured, um, it is both an enabler and facilitator of development, but it would require a lot of uh, ingredients out there. Um, as such, of course, many of the sustainable development goals will hinge on improving the rule of law uh, in a progressive manner, especially in the in, um, area of international and national environmental law. For sound environmental protection and stewardship, Asia and the Pacific will um, uh, get high payoffs by strengthening the rule of law regulations and institutional frameworks, which together with a strong judicial system will support effective enforcement for just and sustainable development outcomes. So it's the right blend and the mix uh, that is required. It's not just about the laws, but it's a strong and functioning judiciary that is fair. In line with Rio Plus 20 outcome document, uh, the future we want, uh, and the Rio Plus 20 statement on justice, governance, and law of environmental sustainability, uh, I do believe that this round table provides us with an opportunity to explore the linkages between the rule of law uh, good and good governance in the management and execution of environmental law to reinforce uh, the sustainable development goals. In interest of that, I will really share with you four messages before I get into them. One is the rule of law is indispensable for achievement of the SDGs. Second, agreement is needed on key principles of rule of law. Third, there is need for a review of the state of national and regional environmental law in Asia and the Pacific. Fourth, partnerships are critical for strengthening institutions and knowledge sharing to improve regional and global frameworks for environmental law. We are very fortunate that Within ESCAP, our first Asia-Pacific uh, Sustainable Development Forum, which we held last year, also had a special panel um, on um, rule of law. Uh, I must confess this is an area which has been under-researched within the context of sustainable development in the sense that there haven't been as many debates on this subject as there have been on other subjects within the United Nations platform. Um, uh, and I was very honored because we did have um, Chief Justice and others there. Uh, so this is a second opportunity thanks to UNEP uh, where we are having this and it's given me some opportunity to reflect myself also and come back to the subject. And we hopefully will feed this into our deliberations in the next two days. So achievement of the 17 specific uh, SDGs um, that you have also touched upon um, uh, for adoption of the, by the international community um, uh, depends, of course, on this rule of law, strengths of the rules of law, rule of law, and the application of the environmental law. Goals designed to uplift people and to ensure provision of basic services cannot be realized without adequate safeguards and prudent management of our natural resources and environmental capital. There are a number of applicable goals to illustrate this, and you have touched upon um, uh, one or two, but let me illustrate with a few of the goals where I think this um, integrated approach is coming out uh, and uh, appreciation of the rule of law to see the interdependence, which is a thing that we are trying to promote in sustainable development. So goal three on healthy lives and well-being for all includes a target to reduce the number of deaths and illness from hazardous chemicals and air, water, and soil pollution and contamination. The other goal, six, illustratively, is on water and sanitation. It seeks to improve water quality by reducing dumping of hazardous chemi chemicals. So you see how the architects of SDGs within United Nations have been trying to get into the nexus, so to speak, of uh, social and environment. 
Another goal 11 deals with sustainability of cities and identifies the need to improve air quality and waste management, again, environmental dimension with sustainability of cities. Goal 14 on oceans and goal 15 on ecosystem deal with targets to protect marine ecosystem and fisheries, halt the loss of biodiversity and end wildlife tracking, trafficking. And you've already talked about the goal 16, which is the mother of all, <laughs> within the context of our debates uh, right now. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that goal. So in addition to, uh, so as we embark on, on this, uh, I actually think we really need multidisciplinary debates out here because it's not just environment, environment it's social, economic, mm -hmm and the trade-offs with the environment. And of course, these tar targets and sub-targets get more uh, intricate as you uh, dissect them further and sit down and look at it. Often the tendency is 169 are too many targets and all that. I'm the first one to subscribe to uh, the brevity of it. But I think there's some merit in our trying to understand how the interlinkages evolve in this. So what do we need? Of course, national action mm, for these goals. But more so, um, as we are in this platform, uh, we require transboundary cooperation and an effective enforcement regime, which has been talked about. So how can we optimize the development of rule of law to respond to the interlinkages presented by the Sustainable Development Goals? The first, as I said, message that I want to uh, give to this platform is the key principles of the environmental law. And Akim, you touched upon quite uh, a few of them. Um, uh, I think how we pick up these principles will shape its application and further development um, for us. One is intergenerational equity consideration, which has to be weaved into law. And I, I'm really proud of some of the work that's been done in context of the environmental work, because it's talking about the future generations more than just the current generation. Second is the transboundary responsibility. You know, we have heard yesterday at lunch about what a sandstorm does to the other neighboring uh, economies and uh, I remember I was uh, in Philippines and we had Pinatubo bus <laughs> and uh, I was traveling um, after it to, to Singapore and Singapore was uh, getting the aftermath of, of that. Third is really public participation. It's very important that the um, uh, lawyers and the, and the uh, judiciary system involve public in, in their debates to understand what pain uh, this whole area causes. And I speak from my personal experience uh, about the delay in justice, which has also been talked about. Um, fourth is good governance um, with simple laws. Uh, I mean, laws seem to be written for lawyers to make money. And I have a problem with that uh, because it is so intricate. Of course, we can, uh, I mean, with all our education and training, it's hard to decipher sometimes. But I, I think we really need to move in the next generation to simple laws where you can understand rather than leave it to others to uh, complicate matter. And of course, you need supporting mechanisms of accountability and transparency, which uh, I can touch upon. Mm. Law should be progressive, modern, prevention, the precautionary principle, and the principle, the polluter pays principle to me is very important. And finally, but the most important, strong political will and support. In South Asia, we've had issues that um, uh, uh, in terms of the selections of the judiciary or interference in the judiciary system. And um, uh, I think this uh, has to stop completely because uh, that's where I mean by the political will to give independence to judiciary. Uh, and of course, uh, to be able to deal with vested interests, anybody who's powerful can threaten you. I mean, I can tell you, as a central bank governor, I used to get threats uh, to be either lifted or um, done something else. So, uh, you know, this is very daunting uh, for people who are in regulatory or quasi-judicial functions, as I was in, in that position. So these principles of environmental law will help to develop robust national and international environmental legal frameworks, 
We know that application of these principles can be hampered by vested interest, a focus on personal and short-term gains, lack of societal concern, knowledge gaps, uncertainties, and regional coordination challenges. We must draw on, of course, another important area, which is science, to understand the complexity of natural systems and effectively manage competing interest. Science, technology, and innovation can also provide us with technological solutions that allow environmental protection and economic development to coexist in harmony. It's doable. Advanced technologies for clean energy generation, waste management, and sustainable agriculture are just a few examples of how trade-offs can be managed. Clear and transparent national and international environmental frameworks can provide the right market signals and incentive, incentivize the development and transfer of these technologies. And this uh, point has been debated a lot on this platform for the last one and a half days. Let me now touch upon environmental law in Asia-Pacific region. I think um, our region is dealing with many contemporary environmental challenges. Uh, let me touch on four overarching trends. Uh, first, that have actually principally been the major contributors to environmental degradation. By, by, I apologize to Akim if I missed few because he's really the expert here, not me. Mm. First is the lack of quality of economic growth with consequent increases in CO2 emissions. That's quite a big one. Second is increased urbanization. You go anywhere in urban cities where cleanliness is not in order, the wastage that's lying out there and the diseases and the degradation of environment it causes. Increased consumption. Uh, I mean, we are reading now literature on obesity, <laughs> uh, which tells you, you know, what excesses have done. And lastly, the pressure of population growth, which admittedly is different from where, where you are. I mean, we have an aging population in some countries as a result of negative population growth, but then we have explosive regions in terms of the population stress. Attendant environmental impacts are not limited in scale to any one country. Smoke from forest fires cross borders and creates health hazards for neighboring countries. Development of hydropower resources has transboundary impacts on downstream fisheries and agriculture. I mean, we see this fascinating debate going on uh, in the borders of China, India, Pakistan on the hydropower resources and what's happening to the uh, to the water basins also and, and the big rivers. Hmm. Biodiversity loss continues with uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, Subregion alone projected to, lo to lose up to 42% of biodiversity by 2100. Cross-border implications necessitate the development of improved international environmental legal frameworks and adherence to the principles of the rule of law. And getting cross-border understanding of what your law is versus what their law is, is very important, and thinking about the commonalities between the law is very important. Strong judiciaries with right expertise are core to the rule of law. Constitutionalism and enforcement of rule of law uh, has to be thought through. Without an effective judiciary, we will end up with constitutions without constitutionalism, which in turn will directly undermine the rule of law. Stronger environmental law underpinned by the rule of law can ensure that markets function efficiently to deliver environmentally sound outcomes and that investment is allocated optimally without undermining natural and social capital. More emphasis also needs to be placed on addressing violations, and I was so glad to be there this afternoon, pertaining to illicit trade, smuggling of chemicals, hazardous waste, logging of timber, wildlife exploitation, depleting natural resources, 
ozone depleting substance and there is a positive story and there is continued issues surrounding all this including the dumping of toxic waste. Greater visibility and reach of the rule of law pertaining to environmental law is needed to curtail these activities and minimize negative environmental impacts. There are many good examples of Asia-Pacific initiatives working to foster regional cooperation on environmental law and its enforcement. We don't have to go far off. The Mekong River Commission promotes the Mekong River's effective coordination of water resource use and environmental management. The ASEAN Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution lays ground rules for 10 countries in Southeast Asia to reduce haze pollution. Not everything has been done, but at least it's a good beginning. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, uh, a global treaty protecting endangered plants and animals from exploitation, has been ratified by almost the entire Asia-Pacific region. Lastly, the Asian Environmental Compliance and Enforcement Network is a group of 13 member states in Asia which promotes improved compliance by its members with environmental legal requirements and good practices amongst, among the regional enforcement agencies. The first Asia and Pacific International Colloquium on Environmental Rule of Law convened by UNEP in Malaysia in December promulgated a statement on environmental rule of law, which provides a useful starting point for a regional dialogue. So compliments to our team here. The constituent elements of environmental rule of law were outlined as adequate and implementable laws, access to justice and information, public participation I talked about, accountability, transparency, liability for environmental damage, fair and just enforcement and human rights. Because there is a broad understanding and commonality on, on, um, of views out there. So what do I do sitting out in ASCAP? Of course, I worked on some of these elements and I've been scratching my head. And I, I do feel that rule of law has uh, uh, a lot of relevance in virtually every, each of the three dimensions. But now that we are out here, and um, given that I have read quite a bit uh, uh, in terms of catching up, I think strengthening the rule of law and harmonization of rules and legislation is a prerequisite for our SCAP intergovernmental platforms. And I say that also in terms of the awareness raising, which is very critical, to promote regional cooperation in the implementation of sustainable development. The rule of law plays a significant role in promoting transport laws for us, uh, regulations and related services. This is all the work that we are involved in. Trade agreements and trade facilitation that ESCAP has been involved. And improvement of civil registration and vital statistics. You go to a judiciary, if you don't, if you don't have an identity, it's a real issue, of course. Uh, but anywhere you go, you really need an identity. And there are lots of missing people in Asia and the Pacific who are not, they are the missing population, they're not recorded. Um, there's much to be learned, shared, and scaled up in, team, in terms of the implementation and enforcement of environmental law. And more work is needed in strengthening the institution that support these processes, such as courts, tribunal, like the one we just learned about from our Indian colleague, and enforcement uh, agencies. So in, in conclusion, I don't think I can do justice uh, to this topic. It is so broad and uh, so deep. Uh, suffice to say that the loss of uh, environmental capital uh, not only impacts our environmental sustainability, but its impacts our social and economic fabric and the dimensions of the sustainable development. Recognizing this, um, we are reflecting on how the strengthening the rule of law, good governance, and environmental law um, can be mainstreamed in our debates of the sustainable development in our region. Uh, of course, closer regional cooperation, which is an, a mandate for ESCAP in uh, environmental law or other laws, will be critical for effective action. 
and ASCAP will be supporting our member states to strengthen their development and enforcement of environment law, but we will do so uh, only if uh, UNAP uh, uh, works with us. Otherwise, we are not getting into it. I can assure you, <laughs> because it's a very tall order. So, um, since um, Akim and I have a memorandum of understanding <laughs> to be signed, there may be an amendment to it, <laughs> if he agrees. So, we, el we welcome our partnership and collaboration of UNEP and other global institutions in this effort. Uh, but it is our shared obligation to the next generation to leave them with cleaner, pure water and healthy ecosystem uh, which could drive the prosperous and inclusive uh, economies we want. Thank you so much uh, for allowing me this opportunity, Akim and his colleagues, um, uh, to share my thoughts uh, on a subject which is pretty close to my heart, as you can see.